by grace are you saved, and that not of yourselves, but it's a free gift of God. And while many are called, few are chosen, and we're told to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, but none of those things are meant to cause us to look at our salvation as though it were in jeopardy, but rather to make it obvious to those around us that we are not fearful of those things that they are fearful of. For instance, working out your salvation would be like knowing that you have no fear of death. You are able to do things that others would not even risk, much less try, like being a missionary. You know, going to a foreign land or a foreign country that maybe puts your life in jeopardy. You don't fear death because, just like some people say, to death to a Christian is just changing his address, you know, because really we're already living in heaven. I mean, we're, we're, we're almost gone. I mean, it's that close. So, what we have left in this life is nothing compared to what's going on up there. I mean, we got so much more that what little time we have left, we ought to cast aside everything that distracts us and put our nose to the grindstone, so to speak, and run the race that's been set before us as though we were runners. Not meaning that we're competing against each other, but that rather we are going the distance, the mile, so to speak. We are going with all that we have, our utmost for his highest. So in doing that, we don't fear our salvation as much as we want to give God all that we have. That we are so amazed by this grace that we've been given that we just want to throw it back at him with joy. We want to exalt him in all of our efforts and being that we could just laugh and dance and sing and rejoice in the day that's coming because we see the end of the world even as it's being manifested and people are fearing and even Christians are getting stuck into things that they ought not to be involved in but we've chosen a different path we've chosen a different way we have decided that our utmost we want to give to the uttermost so that we would follow him in every way that he has said to do. That we're not afraid of being so heavenly minded, we're all earthly good, and to be so heavenly minded that we leave the earth behind. Because we are that close. And really, that soon will be gone. So wouldn't you want to give all that you have? Wouldn't you want to live the life of a believer? Don't you want to give the last gasp of your breath to him? that he might accomplish some good purpose? Don't you want to be, like in the movies, the conquering hero? That in the end, you win? <laughs> I do. Friendship with God. Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Genesis 18, 17. It's delights. The chapter brings out the delight of real friendship with God as compared with the occasional feelings of his presence in prayer. There's so much of this idea of his presence rather than his person. You see, his presence just means you feel the spirit, the spirit of God. Really, you have feelings, you have sensitivities, you have emotions that have been jangled and dangled, you know, and suddenly you're becoming spiritually aware. So to you, it's all a new thing. So this new feeling becomes oh so exciting it gives you goosebumps your hair stand on end you see things and understand things and know things you never knew before and to you it's all new so it's very exciting but Jesus is still there you see he's still inside he's still alive he's still living in you but as you grow and as you begin to become aware that that's normal now and not supernatural then you begin to become conscious of God in you and you begin to be content with the reality of knowing that you're speaking and you're listening and you're hearing God in every move you make and every step you take and all that you exist in because you're choosing that person that's in you to speak through you rather than you speak because you know that you dare not lest you open your mouth and stick your foot in it much less something else that might be embarrassing. So rather than be you alive you say that I no longer live but Christ liveth in me the life that I now live in the flesh I live by the will of the Son of God who died for me and gave himself for me because he is living in you he has become real he's become full up in you <laughs> so are you possessed? yeah really and that's what it is it's a good thing it's not a bad thing you are dispossessed of yourself to be possessed by himself to be so much in contact with God that you never need to ask him to show you his will. 
is to be nearing the final stage of your discipline in the life of faith. <laughs> you, you get to a place where really you do that. You know, there is a time where you just go, you get up and you go. You just get up and do. I mean, you you still pray, you still say, you still know, but you're talking to God inside. You know, you don't have to say the by rote prayers. You know, you don't have to get up and say, "Our Father art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done." Or, you know, the the shakarit or the you know the Jewish prayers or the morning prayers for you know Catholicism or the beads or anything. You don't have to do any of it. You're in fellowship. You're in communication. You're at one with God. You're a friend now. And the friend knows what the other one's thinking and doing. And they are in communication. They experience each other in a very intimate, personal way. And that's what you want. That's why we go to the utmost. Because you want to be like that all through the day. Not just that you know, special time in the morning, but all through the day and night. So that when you move into his presence, literally in heaven, it won't be a shock. It'll be the most natural thing you do. And all this will feel uncomfortable, unnatural. It'll feel kind of dead, like the colors aren't quite alive. The nature isn't quite the same. You don't feel comfortable in this world anymore. You feel like going home. When you are rightly related to God, it is a life of freedom and liberty and delight. You are God's will, and all your common sense decisions are His will for you unless He checks. What a nice place to be that you transformed your mind into his mind, that you know that your common sense ideas and everything that you see in scripture, or especially on the internet when people misquote it, you know it's wrong. Or you see things and hear things and you know that's not right. And you go, no, that's not it. You don't get it. You're missing it. It's about Jesus. Knowing him, living him, allowing him to be alive in you. It's almost as though it were like what people fear, like some kind of cultic experience, but it's not. It's a God experience. Knowing God in the most intimate, personal way that it would fulfill you in every single way that he ever created you to be because you are his created being, created for good works in Jesus that you might accomplish his will according to what he has planned you for. For he has created you for his good pleasure and he has caused you to be a vessel of honor or a vessel of wrath. And the choices that you make and the steps that you take are all designed specifically to bring you to a place of knowing him that intimately. That you're automatically, <laughs> it's not common sense, it's God sense. And you sense that in everything you do. God sense. That knowledge that you're not just walking in the spirit or talking in the spirit or doing things in the spirit, but you're at one with God. At one man. You're at one with Jesus. He's in you. You decide things in perfect, delightful friendship with God, knowing that if your decisions are wrong, He will always check. When He checks, you stop at once. So many times I start to do videos and God just stops me from doing them. Or I start to do some little thing that I want to do on the internet and God stops it. I just go, okay. It's just like, He doesn't say stop. Sometimes He does. One time He did and I think I recorded it. I said, well, the Lord said stop, so I'm stopping it. I made that one video and I stopped for the day. <laughs> Because he told me, stop. you know, And then through the day, he told me he needed to rest and to take it easy. And I was kind of like, that's what a friend does. That's what a personal, intimate relationship with God does. That's how it is when you live with the living God. Because, you see, the children of Israel had that experience. The people of the land said, hey, you know, we can deal with all the other gods of the land. But they, the children of Israel, they have a living God. He does things for them. He actually really does do things. He's real. And they feared that because they didn't know quite how that relationship worked. And sometimes, you know, you're going to find that <laughs> maybe you don't understand it yet, but it's a loving relationship. You you get these little quirky little things that God does that's kind of neat, you know, because he's wanting to touch you in your heart, which is quirky. So he meets you where you're at. So you only see a part of him, but that part of him that you see is very personal, very unique, very you and he that no one else has. Because the very hairs on your head are counted, the very numbers of the stars are known by name. He cares about you so much that he can be that intimate and real when you 
are ready for it because <laughs> it's kind of different. <laughs> it's difficulties. Why did Abraham stop praying when he did? He was not intimate enough to yet to go boldly on until God granted his desire. There was something yet to be desired in his relationship to God. He still needed to learn something. Whenever we stop short in prayer and say, well, I don't know, perhaps it's not God's will, then it's still another stage for you to go through that you haven't arrived there yet or been taught the reality of who God is to know what his will is. And as he wants us to be, that they may be one even as we are one, think of the last thing you prayed about. Were you devoted to your desire or to God? Did you want what you wanted from him or did you want God? Period. Determined to get some gift of the Spirit or to get at God. Your Heavenly Father knows what things you have need of before you ask him. The point of asking is that you may get to know God better. That's why you ask because then you know where it came from, no matter how it arrives. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he should give you the desires of your heart. Keep praying in order to get a perfect understanding of God himself. Praying should be, in part, and I know I, haven't, I keep saying I'm going to give a teaching on it, but a, a big part of praying should be able to be translated into communicating or talking, not just petitioning, not just throwing out some requests, or asking for something, but communicating back and forth. We see that in Jesus. Jesus didn't just pray and it was as though they didn't talk back and forth. No. If anything, we have recorded the Father talking to Jesus and Jesus talking to the Father. And then he, Jesus says, that's what I want you to do. It's like, well, okay. And another example would be kind of like, in a way, although it's not totally done both ways, but in Fiddler on the Rough, when Tuvi is saying, if I were a rich man, oh God, what are you doing? You know, you could do this, you could do that. You don't do this, you do this, you do that. So what are you doing? You don't tell me? I don't know. I have such a deal, I figure it out. You know, and it's cute, but it's not really two-way. It's kind of a blinded way, you know, that kind of goes by circumstantial hopefuls and working it out by way of kind of it worked out, open door, closed door mentality. God wants you to be personal. He wants you to understand his nature of love because he's been misrepresented for a long time and constantly there is the world other people, Satan himself other angels, powers, principalities all kinds of things that are trying to misrepresent God to you and even at times I'm sure you misrepresent God to you but the more you get to know him the more you understand his nature the more you begin to comprehend how big and fathomless he really is the more intimate in other ways he makes himself known to you in a very real way so that his vastness doesn't overwhelm you, but that his tenderness connects you to his heart and you become intimate to him in a real way that changes you from day to day, from glory to glory, from image to image into the incorruptible image of his son so that you have that oneness with the Father that you've always desired to have and that he wants you to have before you die so that when you die you just fly to him you just go away to him you just run to him and you just open your arms and you cast your arms about him and you just love him for who he is because he is your maker he did create you he's the creator of all but he's also because of Jesus your daddy your father and I can't think of a more intimate personal relationship to have than one with God our Father.